air rate operations gave us no reprieve whatsoever. We were obliged to fly out whenever the bombers flew in, and since this was every night, we were all beginning to show signs of fatigue. The squadron had enough crews to provide a rotation of men from sortie to sortie, but the nervous strain of such sorties was great. Our losses were still low, but every night we had to contend with searchlights, anti-aircraft artillery and enemy night fighters, and sometimes we were shelled from our own bombers. The period of time we spent over enemy territory was long, at least two hours. And, of course, we realised that if we were shot down and could parachute out, we were unlikely to return until after the war, during air defence sorties. On the other hand, we knew that if we had to use a parachute, we could return to our comrades within a few hours. However, only one pilot broke down. One of my brave Belgian pilots came to me totally distraught and complained that during the last few sorties he had been forced to turn back to base before even crossing the enemy coast because of a failure of his airborne radar or serrate instrument. He suspected that his radio operator was deliberately reporting equipment failure. It was a serious charge, but I believed the pilot. I decided to send them out again that evening, and if they returned for the reasons given by the pilot, the airplane should be isolated until the next departure, but with a different crew. If the new crew does not find any equipment malfunctions, we will have a pretty convincing proof of the radio operator's cowardice. Indeed, the Belgian and his radio operator returned from the sortie prematurely. The next night, Vinnie and Scotty departed on the same airplane. No work had been done on the equipment, and they flew over enemy territory without finding any malfunction of the serrate instrument or radar. I sent for a Belgian radio operator who admitted that he did not want to participate in the sorties. He convinced me that he would not survive. Frankly, he was a coward. I had little sympathy for him because I knew that we all felt fear at some stage of this game, and many of us had much more to lose than he did, but by self-discipline we managed to defeat or hide our fear inside. This officer was removed from the squadron, and my Belgian pilot began flying with another radio operator. In a tragic irony of fate, they were soon shot down near Bremen. The fact that I had allowed sticks to fly non-stop for too long had taught me a good lesson, and I tried to give all crews short rests. It was also becoming obvious that I too was in need of some drastic changes. My temper was getting rough, and I was overworked from flying to the point of stupefaction. One day the squadron received word that the Royal Navy would be happy to take two officers on board one of its destroyers at Harwich for a few days. The destroyer was part of a convoy escort travelling along the east coast. It was just what I needed, and I decided that the hard-working buster, our spy, should also go with me. We arrived at the Wichita, a rather ancient ship. As we climbed up the gangway, I suddenly remembered a certain old tradition of saluting on the Utes. Turning to Buster, I asked him where the place was. He shrugged his shoulders. An officer and two or three sailors were waiting for us to step on deck, so I had to try to do the right thing. I didn't want to start our vacation with a big embarrassment. Trying to look casual, I cast a hard look at the main mast and gave a quick salute, hoping it would be acceptable. The look of disdain that flashed across the faces of the military sailors showed that my ignorance had not gone unnoticed. The commander of the ship was a young lieutenant. I remember being surprised at his low rank. It seemed to me that his duties at least merited the rank of frigate captain, but that was none of my business. The passage with the convoy along the east coast to Firth of Forth, which lasted two days, cheered me up and I found that in the company of sailors I was able to forget entirely the troubles which had overwhelmed me during the last few weeks. We were kept fully occupied on the ship. Occasionally we were asked to identify airplanes, and it was then that we appreciated how annoying it was for military sailors to see airplanes appearing nearby. And we also realised that if they waited until they determined whether the plane was their own or an enemy plane, it would often be too late. The plane would get a chance to attack. So their tendency to shoot first and ask questions later may have been justified. At the entrance to Firth of Forth, the witch he'd said goodbye to her charges and, in company with two other destroyers and a cruiser, headed back to Harwich at speed. Thank goodness the sea had been relatively calm during the whole crossing and I felt fine. But when the engines of the old witch head were running at full speed, they caused such a vibration that I almost felt nauseous, but managed to maintain the honour of a Royal Air Force officer. I returned to Harwich a new man and was grateful to our naval friends for their wonderful hospitality. 
While Jacko was settling in at wittering and familiarising himself with the serrate instrument, Styx and I made another sortie. This was to be our last flight together for seven months. A very large formation of our bombers had been ordered to attack the industrial centre of Mannheim in southwestern Germany. We decided that the most suitable point for refuelling and launching would be Bradwell Bay Airfield, near the mouth of the Thames. The 605th Mosquito Fighter Bomber Squadron, in which Dave Blomley, my sister's husband, was serving, was stationed there. I hadn't seen him since the start of the war, and now I met him again. We spent a few happy hours reminiscing as I waited for takeoff time. Dave was pleased with flying fighter bombers, but envied my squadron with its radar and serrate instruments. Mosquitoes made long and dangerous flights at night at low altitude deep into enemy territory, trying to find enemy aircraft, but since they did not have any airborne radar, their successes were marginal. Shortly before midnight, nine of my planes took to the air at intervals of a few minutes. We were gaining altitude in a southeasterly direction to make contact with the masses of bombers that were gathering in a stream in front of us. North of Dunkirk, we saw anti-aircraft artillery fire and searchlights. Over the Belgian-German border, the darkness was broken only by the bursting of anti-aircraft shells. We could clearly see puffs of smoke from shells exploding nearby, and once or twice our airplane was shaken by a blast wave. Around us in the sky, we could see burning airplanes. Some of them were slowly descending toward the ground while their crews tried unsuccessfully to maintain control. Others were falling like flaming meteors. With Styx's help, I pursued a night fighter, but that one turned on the radar, so we had to start over again. Near Liege, the Styx caught a steady sig pile, and after flying in a circle at 3,000 meters, we finally made radar contact. It was obvious that the enemy was unaware of our presence, and Styx, quickly interpreting the readings of his radar indicators, skillfully brought me into position from the rear hemisphere. At a range of 135 meters, I spotted an indistinct dark object. I could not identify it from this distance and turning to keep low, began to approach until we were only 90 away. The object now took on the familiar shape of a Messerschmitt 110. From this distance I could not miss. I fired two short bursts from all ten of our barrels. The hits were visible all over the tail section of the Messerschmitt. It flipped over the wing and, catching fire, spiraled to the ground. At that moment, the darkness was pierced by a white flare fired from another plane nearby. It may have come from a German night fighter whose pilot had marked the spot where it had fallen, thinking that this funeral pyre belonged to one of our bombers. We searched for this or other German fighters as long as fuel allowed, but in vain. At Mannheim, burning furiously in the distance, we turned back to Bradwell Bay and landed there three hours after takeoff, exhausted but successful. One of my crew saw a white rocket and an explosion as our victim fell. They were able to confirm our aerial victory, which increased my total score to 15 victories, 14 of them at night. Gradually we were closing in on John Cunningham, who had 18 night victories. I was particularly pleased with this success, considering Styx's position. He could now rest easy knowing he had done well. For his bravery and determination as radio operator and navigator, I presented him for a buckle to the previously awarded Distinguished Flying Combat Cross. We were a most happy crew when we celebrated the official announcement of this award a few days later. Our much-loved air station commander, Group Captain Leg, had been reassigned to another duty station. He always took care of us and had acquired the habit of being at our location, waiting until the last airplane returned, which was usually in the early morning. He would then join us for our usual breakfast of scrambled eggs and bacon, listening to our stories of the night's work. We decided to have a special farewell party for him with dinner and gift giving. We'd gotten around the food restrictions in a roundabout way. Thanks to Whippen, we got a lot of pheasants and a special bird for the main course. I wasn't told of this surprise until the very last minute. It was a swan kindly roasted by Wynn. The party went splendidly, but we were saddened by the fact that the grouper caption was leaving us. However, Wittering was lucky enough to get an equally sympathetic boss to take his place. During the period of non-flying weather, we conducted ground drills so that everyone could learn close combat. Aircraft crews, led by me, posed as parachutists. At the end of the day, we were dropped from trucks a few kilometres from the airfield and had to go back and destroy our craft and vital installations. The air station administrative staff and squadron ground staff, led by Dickie Sparrow, were in charge of the defence. It was a damp evening. 
each mud-covered group moved toward the airfield by a roundabout route. Our hands and faces were black. By the time my unit reached the staging area, it had gone completely dark, but thin beams of light were flickering over the airfield in the popping of explosive packages to show that the defenders were alert. Both sides had explosive packs to simulate grenades. It was obvious from the swearing and shouting that the defenders were giving my commandos heat. Eventually, we did advance and drew chalk crosses on the two bow marking their destruction. We were then surrounded and captured, but before we did so, Styx tried to throw an explosive package. Unfortunately, he held it too long and it exploded in his hand, injuring his wrist. The defenders were true gentlemen. Rather than give us a run around, they sent old Styx to docks, and the rest of us were simply led to one of the rooms of the barracks on the riser, which was being used as a prisoner of war camp. Apart from the trouble with Styx, no other accidents occurred. It remained to consider the results of the exercise. Several airplanes were destroyed and ground structures were also blown up. At the same time, all my commandos were either killed or captured. In addition to fun and good exercise, we all learned useful lessons. The main one was that it was almost impossible to stop a determined enemy and prevent him from achieving his intended objective, even though it might have cost him all his strength. One can only speculate what might have happened if the Germans, during the Battle of Britain, had decided to sacrifice some of their experienced paratroopers to attack some of our key ground-based long-range detection radars. Perhaps the outcome of that famous battle would have been different. One of my concerns from the time Serrate operations began was the limited range of the bugfighters. Bomber Command's raids on Berlin and on industrial areas in northern Italy had made it clear that we could not accompany our friends all along their routes. We usually sent half of the airworthy fighters with a stream of bombers to fly in it as long as possible. The rest would take off later in the night to meet the returning bombers again as far back on their route as possible. This was not very good. It was splitting our small force in half, but it was the best we could do. In discussing the problem with officers at Fighter Command Headquarters, I requested that our BUs be replaced by mosquitoes that had a longer range. I was promised to look into the matter but nothing could be done immediately. We were not yet ready to allow mosquitoes with the latest airborne radars to fly over enemy territory. When we arrived at Wittering, there was only one flying unit, a blind flight training unit equipped with Oxfords. Its mission was to conduct small training courses for selected pilots of fighter command to improve their proficiency in instrument flying and to acquaint them with the latest developments in this field. Later in the summer, our ranks were swelled by an American Lockheed Lightning long-range fighter squadron, which was part of a fighter group dispersed between Wittering and the Auxiliary Airfield at nearby Kingscliff. This squadron, although coming straight from the States and with no combat experience, quickly endeared themselves to us by their zeal and spirit. Their mission was to escort the ever-increasing day bomber formations of the U.S. 8th Air Force. We did not envy them. It soon became obvious from their losses that the Lightning could not compete with the Messerschmitt 109 and the Focke Wolf 190. Soon Major McGovern, the squadron commander, and I became real friends, and perhaps because of this, a good relationship developed between our squadrons. There was only one problem. Our allies proved to be incorrigible card players, and usually their stakes were very high, above the means available to the average member of the Royal Air Force. Some of my men thought they could compete with them and found themselves on the losing end. Of course my lads didn't want the Americans to think they were trembling over every penny, but I had to stop these money games to ensure good relations between the squadrons. I was also concerned about the fact that a significant loss was associated with a reduction in the pilot's combat effectiveness. Experience had shown that a nervous pilot could make a fatal mistake. McGovern understood my argument and agreed. Both squadrons took the decision to ban games favorably. It didn't take Jacko long to master the serrate instrument. Soon we were flying together again. The first flights were easy. Bomber Command was hitting targets in northern Italy, and this gave Jacko extra time to get his bearings. Then we took off from Ford. The flights proved to be very boring and uneventful. The only exciting moment during these three flights was when on the way back we boredom attacked the German airfield of Miran near Paris. It was a clear moon at night. We spiked on our bue and shelled the hangars from a low altitude. We didn't see what damage we did, but we certainly woke up the defenders. They filled the sky with streams of anti-aircraft shells, but their accuracy was poor. Bomber Command then turned its attention back to Germany. The opposition here was quite different. 
and there was always the chance of engaging one of the many German night fighters. For some time, the British government and Royal Air Force headquarters had been concerned by information that the enemy was developing two powerful new types of weaponry, the unmanned Fayui-1 aircraft and the Fau-2 medium-range missile. They both had powerful high-explosive warheads. Intelligence data and decoded images taken by our reconnaissance planes showed that the main work on the development and testing of these new missiles was being carried out in Payamundi on the coast of the Baltic Sea. If we do not take urgent countermeasures, then in a short time the enemy will begin full-scale production of FAL and will be able to bomb England on a scale never dreamed of before. And on the afternoon of August 17 sticks, my new operations officer received an urgent message from Fighter Command headquarters. The 141st was ordered to make a maximum effort at night in support of one of the most important Bomber Command raids of the war. A powerful raid on the Experimental Armament Center at Pinamundi was planned. The true purpose of this raid was not known to us at the time, but we had enough information to support the need to get as many fighters in the air as possible. We began to plan our tactics while Sewell, the squadron engineer, assembled ground personnel to determine the status of the aircraft. Because of the complexity of Serrate's airborne radar and instrumentation, we rejoiced each night if we could get 12 of our 19 airplanes into service. Invariably, one or two of them returned prematurely because of some malfunction of the instrumentation. Sewell returned to the briefing room and surprised us all by telling us that we could count on 16 airplanes that night. This really meant something, as the squadron had been on combat sorties for the past five nights and the flight and ground personnel were very tired. The so hard work and dedication of our men never ceased to amaze me. During these same months, when our chances of making a combat sortie had greatly increased, morale reached a high point. Mechanics worked long hours without complaint so that their crews would have hope of attacking the enemy, leaning with sticks and buster over the map. I saw that the route of the stream of bombers passed over the North Sea, 130 kilometers north of the Frisian Islands, over Denmark and then south to the target. The return route was much the same. Because of the limited range of the Bu, we could only fly to the line that went from north to south through the island of Helgand. As a result, we decided to send only half of the planes with the bombers, and the rest were to meet them on the return trip. In previous sorties, we had always flown within the bomber stream or distributed along its edges. Now it was deemed more proper to patrol between the enemy and our bombers. Eight fighters were to take off at the same time as our big friends. Four of them would patrol at altitudes between 37,700 and 5,000, 500 meters along a line running west to east about 30 kilometers north of the Frisian Islands to Helgoland. The other four were to patrol along a line beginning south of Emden and continuing over the northern part of Iselma Bay. This created for the Germans two thin red lines between their night fighters and our bo Our remaining fighters later in the night were to be deployed in the same way to meet the returning Lancasters and Halifaxes. On paper, this seemed a logical plan. The general briefing was scheduled for 1600 hours. I went to the officer's mess hall to wake Jacko, who was trying to catch up on lost sleep. Like the rest of us, he was exhausted from flying all three previous nights. We had to give him a good shake to get him to leave his bed. We flew to Kaltishall, which was again our starting point. There we did a final check of the airplanes and checked the weather. The weatherman promised us a beautiful night with a full moon and minor high cloud cover. This was good for us, but I did not envy our big brothers, because such conditions favoured the night fighters of the Luftwaffe as well. For a short while Jacko and I lay back in our chairs. Then at 21.30 I gathered all the crews for a few final words and wished them good luck before going up in my abuju with Jacko to lead the first wave. We crossed the English coast near Cromer, taking a course over the North Sea to Helgond. I forgot my fatigue for a while, although later that night it affected me. This time we couldn't see the bombers on our airborne radar as they were much farther north, but Jacko was checking it anyway to make sure he was okay. He also had to make sure we reached the patrol line north of the Frisian Islands at the correct point. Maintaining a speed of about 260 kme, almost matching the speed of the bombers, I hoped to convince the German defences that we were a plane out of the main stream and thus attract one or two night fighters. After 50 minutes of flight, we reached the western end of our patrol line. Even the small clouds had now cleared and visibility seemed endless. To starboard, we could see the dark outlines of the islands. 
beyond them to the south the coastline of Holland and ahead, in the distance the mouth of the Ems River. Not a single light was visible, but by this time hundreds of our bombers were rumbling toward their target. Pen Surely the German air defence must have detected something by now. I could vaguely see the heavily armed fort of Helgon underhead. There was no point in flying through the fire of its guns, so I took a little south. Every few seconds I asked Jacko if he had detected anything. So far there was nothing. At the end of the patrol line I turned around and headed back. I had just levelled the airplane after the turn when Jacko reported. Bob, I have a serrate contact. Turn left and climb to 60 metres. I could tell from his voice that he was picking up something specific. Bob, I think we've got one of them. Continue left turn. OK, now level off. He's definitely ahead and a little higher. Do you have radar contact? No, not yet. But as we continue on this course, we're getting closer. Keep your eyes open. There's a lot of other buggers around. We were approaching the night fighter, but we couldn't know exactly how far away it was until we made radar contact. It was obvious by the number of signals on the serrate instrument that the enemy was aware of the appearance of our bombers and was now heading at top speed to intercept. Minutes passed as we converged, flying in a northeasterly direction back toward Helgoland. I surveyed the sky looking for an enemy that might be sneaking up on us. Bob, there is a radar contact at 4,000, 500 metres slightly to the left and above. Maximum speed and smooth left turn. Jacko's messages were now following a steady stream, as if he wanted to get us flying toward the target. I adjusted the scope brightness and strained to look ahead and up. We were now 360 metres away, and I wanted to detect my enemy much sooner than he detected me. Bob, he's only 360 metres away, just ahead and a little higher. You should be able to see him now. Jacko was getting impatient. Why didn't I see the enemy plane? Perhaps my overexertion was affecting my vision, my eyes were cutting up. Suddenly he appeared in front of me very clearly. Two engines, double tail feathers, our constant enemy, night fighter Messerschmitt 110, he was turning gently to the left. Yucko, raise your head. A, OK, I see him. Give him a good shot. At 230 metres, I gently pulled the wheel toward me. Myself and the beamer shuddered as I pressed the fire button. The enemy went into a gentle dive toward the sea. We followed him and I fired a second line. A flash of fire and he began to drop vertically. I climbed again to an altitude of 4,900 metres, again heading for Ameland. Before we levelled off, Jacko vigorously command. Nurse up right. There's another one just a few hundred metres away. I was leading the bue in a steep turn when Jacko transmitted. Um, attention, he's only 180 metres ahead and a little higher. You're closing too fast. Oh my God, I can see him, I shouted. Above me was another Messerschmitt 110 making a sharp turn, and at the speed at which we were flying, it looked like we were going for a ram. I took the helm, caught it in my sights, and opened fire at about 45 metres, its straight shot range. A blinding flash followed as the me exploded right in front of my face. Our bue began thrashing violently from side to side, threatening to flip over on its back. My windshield was covered with oil stains from the exploding plane, whose wreckage crashed into the sea. God, that was close, was all I could utter. As we performed a turn, I saw a parachute in the moonlight, gently descending downward. My blood boiled. Perhaps it was a reaction to the fact that we had only by luck avoided a collision, or perhaps because I was exhausted. I called Jacko on the intercom. One of the bastards must have escaped, I'm going to finish him off. I was already turning toward the chute when Jacko said, Bob, leave that poor sod alone. That remark brought me back to my senses. As we flew past the pathetic figure hanging on the end of the parachute, I wished I could tell him that his life had been saved by the compassion of my radio operator, a Jew like many of those, the Nazis murdered in the ghettos and concentration camps in Europe. We climbed again to 4,900 metres and headed toward Amelaide. Jacko was still getting signals on the serrate instrument, but by this time fatigue had taken its toll. I was so exhausted I could barely see anything. The Jacko, I think that's enough. Let's fly home. The rest of the guys should have a good account too. Jacko was also tired but he wanted to keep patrolling. Bob, we still have plenty of ammunition. Maybe we can hit a couple more. 
I'm afraid he had no chance of winning that argument. The two weary but satisfied pilots spiked toward the North Sea and turned west toward home. Almost four hours after takeoff, we landed safely at Wittering. Some of the crew had already returned, but more than half, including the second wave, were still in the air. We had a pretty good night. In addition to our two downed airplanes, another crew reported one more destroyed and one damaged airplane. Even though Jacko and I were exhausted, having spent several nights without proper sleep, we were determined to wait for everyone else to return. At 30 everyone returned, and I was pleased that we had suffered no losses. My squadron had destroyed four enemy planes and damaged one. I was a little disappointed. I thought we could have done better, but no doubt our presence caused very great confusion to the enemy. We probably saved the lives of many of the crews of our bombers. We learned later that the raid on Peppermund was very successful. About 700 personnel were killed there, including many experienced technicians. But much more important was the fact that the development and production of the fire weapons was delayed by about nine months. Bomber Command paid a heavy price for this. Of the approximately 600 airplanes, more than 50 did not return. Most were lost near and over the target, again indicating the need for an airplane of greater range than the Boo Fighter. Soon several early modifications of Mosquito Fighters were turned over to the squadron for testing. But they were just a bunch of worn-out airplanes. Before reaching the 141st, they were first used in squadrons and then in combat training units. Their engines brought us endless problems at high altitudes. Still, these few airplanes allowed the crews to master the Mosquitoes, which were superior to the Bufighter. However, none could match the durability of our favoured Bufighters. In many instances, they came back when other airplanes should have fallen apart by now. We never used these first few Mosses for combat sorties because of their unreliability but would have appreciated them had we received newer modifications. During some of our daytime test flights, we had training battles with American McGovern Lightnings, and even given our lack of experience flying mosquitoes, the Lightnings stood a poor chance against us in combat. Because of our ever-increasing victory count, Jacko and I were often mentioned in the press. Usually the articles amused us, but occasionally they were also very embarrassing. I wondered where the information was coming from, the evening after the raid on Pinimund, I was asleep in my room when the door opened and Vini appeared with a newspaper in his hand. Did you see this, sir? Vini asked with a sly smile. He knew perfectly well that I had not seen the paper. I grabbed the paper and read the headline of an article that recounted a recent experience Jacko and I had had. It included a not-so-accurate description of our fighting and details of my life. Apparently I was being groomed to be an angel as I was described as a great lover of Greek classics and a confirmed teetotaler. No wonder Charles Vinney looked at me askew. I was extremely angry at the time, but later found it amusing. Some reporter had interviewed my proud father and, I'm afraid, twisted what he had to say. In fact, I gave up reading the Greeks the moment I left school and, frankly, I could hardly call myself a teetotaler. It took me many days to gloss over the myth of my puritanical existence. Shortly after the squadron's success during the night raid on Pina Mundi, I was awarded a buckle to my Distinguished Combat Service Order. To quote the official report, for brilliant leadership of 141 squadron and exceptional skill and bravery displayed during combat sorties. Sound words that I hope I lived up to. My successes were the result of the concerted efforts of the pilot, radio operator and ground staff. So I believe the award belonged to the entire squadron. There was a boisterous celebration in which the entire 141st participated. We were very hot and young and probably overdid it with alcohol, as we had on previous occasions. I am not trying to make excuses at all. Some may think we went too far. I agree, but I believe there were good reasons for this behaviour. Many authors, especially British, have a tendency to downplay this aspect of service during the war. Air Force officers seem to have been paragons of virtue, with nothing but heroic words and milk flowing from their lips. Except for a few instances, the reality was quite different. Let's face it, there were many reasons why we drank too much. For some, alcohol was a way to escape reality or suppress fear. Others, perhaps with less imagination, had the attitude, let's fully enjoy life. We could be dead tomorrow. As for my own motivations, I've never tried to analyse them, but I think fear was at the heart of them. Not only fear of buying in myself, but also fear of showing my fear to others. I am not trying to justify myself, 
but I want to remind the reader of the terrible responsibility that pressed on our generation of young people, some of whom were still boys. The intensification of hostilities against the enemy meant that my visits to my family in Leicester would become short and infrequent. I realized that I had reached the stage where my responsibilities to my wife and children had taken a back seat to the work of running the squad. It was a difficult time for Joan. I was becoming an irritable and less than understanding spouse. The effects of the long combat sorties were taking their toll, although I didn't realize it at the time. Some of the raids of our bombers did not require an escort, such as raids on Italy or on ports on the Channel Coast. German fighters rarely appeared because the targets were outside the main Luftwaffe defense belts. The only opposition was from German anti-aircraft artillery. Still, we would occasionally just in case release our bouge. On one of these light sorties, along with bombers attacking ports on the Channel Coast, we suffered one of our few losses from enemy action. No enemy fighters were sighted, but anti-aircraft artillery fire was intense. On the way back, one of our BU was hit by anti-aircraft fire. The pilot, Flight Lieutenant Ferguson, began to dive his badly damaged plane toward the English Channel, hoping to make it to England. Whether he was wounded or not, his radio operator, Flight Officer Osborne, never knew. Just a few kilometers off the coast at an altitude of 60 or 90 meters, the pilot informed the radio operator that they would have to land on the water. The events that followed are shrouded in fog. The bow lost control and spun steeply into the water. Osborne remembered nothing of the accident itself, regaining consciousness in the water, supported by a life jacket to which a personal lifeboat was tethered by a cable. He inflated the lifeboat by means of a carbon dioxide cylinder, climbed into it, and to his amazement found that he was only slightly concussed, and everything else seemed to be intact. There was no pilot to be seen, only wreckage and oil stains on the water. In a state of shock, Osborne spent a cold night bobbing up and down in the channel, almost in sight of the French coast, and wondering by whom he would be rescued, by us or by the enemy. All of us at Witterepti knew that one of our planes had long overdue its return, and there was no information that it had landed. We assumed the worst. Terrifying telegrams were sent to the parents of the crew members, informing them that their sons were missing. The next morning, Osborne's father visited the squadron, determined to find out the details. Despite his excitement, he held himself well, and I told him the little we knew. I did not want to give vain hopes. Meanwhile, Dickie, my adjutant, was in touch with a squadron of rescue seaplanes which was operating in the target area of the previous night's raid. Mr. Osborne and I were talking about the war in general and trying to keep out of the discussion of his son's fate when Dickie burst into the office. A rescue Valrus, an amphibious biplane patrolling near the French coast, had located the lifeboat and hoisted Osboria aboard close to an enemy minefield. A very daring rescue. A few hours later Osborne arrived at Wittering, a little sunburnt, but apparently not at all damaged. I have seldom felt happier than when I saw the meeting of father and son. I was sure the father had already assumed his boy was dead. This beautiful moment was overshadowed for me by the knowledge that the brave pilot had drowned with the airplane. Throughout the summer of 1943, the number of enemy night fighters shot down by the squadron grew. As in other squadrons, most of the successes were accounted for by only one or two crews. The others became only prey. I'm sure the main reason was that only these few crews achieved the extremely high level of cooperation and coordination required for night combat. The aces were also superb masters of utilizing onboard radar and serrate devices. They obtained enough information from these sophisticated devices to locate the enemy, even when the equipment was only partially serviceable. In 141 Squadron, the names of Flight Lieutenant Howard Kelsey and his operator, Sergeant Smith and of Flight Lieutenants White and Allen, another outstanding crew, began to appear regularly in combat reports. Since the raid on Pinamande, each crew had destroyed more than five aircraft over enemy territory and had been decorated for their actions. By the end of the war, they had achieved even greater success and were high on the list of the best night fighters. At the beginning of September 1943, rumors began to leak into the squadron that I was going to be transferred to some position unrelated to combat missions. To me, it sounded like a funeral bell. My squadron was everything to me, meant more than my wife and family. Of course, I was overworked but I didn't realize it. Against my better judgment, I hoped it was only a rumor. As if defying fatigue, I increased my number of sorties and once nearly killed Jacko. 
we participated with the bombers in a raid on the Mont Lucop tunnel in southeastern France. There were no enemy night fighters, so I decided to fly at low altitude and strafe the trains on the way back, flying in bright moonlight at 355 Cadme. At an altitude of 600 meters, we spotted one on the Dieppe Paris line near Paris. It was traveling at a decent speed. As we descended, we fired a long line of all barrels at the steam locomotive, which exploded, raising a cloud of steam and sparks. There was no return anti-aircraft fire from the train, and as it stood up we made a circle over it and flew on to find the next target. Very soon we saw another train moving toward Paris from Amiens. I spiked again, firing a long line from all our powerful weapons. In my desire to destroy this train I had completely forgotten the altitude. There was an explosion ahead. Purely by reflex I pulled the helm sharply toward me. We hit the tops of the trees along the railroad embankment. We returned to an altitude of six or nine hundred meters deeply shaken. But the airplane seemed still airworthy, despite the hole in the bottom of the fuselage between Jacko and me. An hour later we landed and hurried to the bar to regain our spirits. An inner voice told me that if I didn't take a vacation we wouldn't last long. It seems that my thoughts were heard. For a few days later, I was granted a short vacation. I was ordered to Kenley Airfield, made famous during the Battle of Britain, to participate in rehearsals for a ceremony to celebrate in London, the regular anniversary of the victory in that battle. The Royal Air Force and Women's Auxiliary Contingents assembled their march along the tarmac highway and runway of the then seldom-used airfield. Learning that I had been selected to lead a group of Battle of Britain veterans, as they marched through the streets of London came as a shock. I believed there were people far more deserving of it. My contribution to the famous battle was just one enemy plane shot down at night in August 1940. I suggested that the group should be led by one of the famous aces of the time, and I would have gladly followed him myself. But my requests were ignored, so for a couple of days under the supervision of formation instructors and senior Royal Air Force chips, I led my unit of pilots and navigators on a march and parade march. On the appointed Sunday, we were bussed to London. We lined up with many other units representing anti-aircraft artillery, police, firefighters, civil defence, the women's voluntary service, nurses and women's auxiliary. There were over 3,000 of us. The parade was diversified by bands and the whole column stretched over 1.5k. The bands caused us to walk out of step most of the time. The music reverberated off the buildings along our route, causing us confusion. The constant short stops of the women's auxiliary unit. Marching directly ahead of us turned my boys into real shufflers. I've had enough of the women's auxiliary girls and never want to march behind them again. The challenges of constantly changing feet and the cheers of thousands of spectators completed my confusion. We marched down Mal Road in front of Buckingham Palace, saluting the King. It was the only moment in the course of our march when more through luck than good judgment. We kept pace with the unit in front of us. Fortunately, a few minutes later near Wellington Barracks, I disbanded my band and vowed that I would rather face the Hun hordes than fight my way through the cheering crowd again. The rumour of my transfer soon became a fact. Breham was ordered to attend course No. 12 at the Army Staff College in Camberley beginning October 21, 1943, a mere black month. I challenged the decision to make this transfer in vain, and even asked for a personal meeting with the commanding officer, Air Marshal Sir Roderick Hill. After a cup of tea in his office, this kind man told me that he fully understood my desire to stay with the squadron, but it was obvious to him that I urgently need a vacation, and four months at the Staff College will fully restore my strength. I had to admit to myself that he was right. My replacement, Wing Commander Robert E. of the Air Training Command, was not due to arrive at Wittering until early October, so Jacko and I could fly together for a few more weeks. We participated actively in raids against the enemy, and after destroying two more and damaging one aircraft, brought my total score to 20 victories, 19 of which were won at night and one during the day, in addition to having one probable victory and six damaged aircraft. With the help of Styx and Jacko, I was now equal to John Cunningham in the number of night victories. Our number of night victories with him remained unchanged for the rest of the war and was exceeded only by Brands Barnbridge and his radio operator Skelton, who shot down 21 aircraft at night. My last combat sortie with the squadron took place on the night of August 29. Accompanying our bombers during a raid on Bochim in the Ruha, 
we destroyed a Messerschmitt 110 and damaged a Junkers 88 in two separate engagements over Iselma Bay in 10 minutes. This sortie, besides being a good finale to my tour with 141 Squadron, was also the first experience of night fighting for my American comrade Major McGovern. Mac had been pestering me for some time with requests to take him along. He brought us good luck, although we later had our guns jammed. Otherwise our second night enemy, an 88 Yopters, would also have been destroyed rather than just damaged. Our worst enemy on this particular sortie, however, was our own light, anti-aircraft artillery. The gunners of a light battery of Beaufort's on the Norfolk coast, between Hemsby and Winterton, tried to shoot us down as we flew back at 400 altitude. After much cursing at the infantry, we moved out of their range. Since had been in contact with our base for some time, we could not understand why we were being treated as the enemy. Although I had only been in command of the 141st for ten months, it was a period of varied and hectic activity. Squadron morale was low, but I was fortunate enough to see it grow until it became first class, thanks to the determination of every individual in the unit. It may be unfair to pick out individuals to thank when everyone did so much, but I am especially grateful to Flight Lieutenant Bernard Sparrow Dickey, my adjutant, and Buster Reskolds, our spy. Unlike the airplane crews, none of these officers received any tangible thanks for their hard work. Yet they did a great deal for the squadron and always gave me good advice. The squadron switched from defensive operations to offensive operations with outstanding success. Our casualties were relatively low. Indeed, the 141st lived up to its motto Camus Noctu to you. We kill by now. Before leaving Witter Ripdi solemnly promised Styx and Jacko, they were both second to none in their field, that I would do my best to transfer them to whatever unit I was posted to after Staff College. This was a little disloyal to Wing Commander Roberts, my successor, but he appreciated my feelings for these two officers who had shared with me most of the triumphs and deliverances from danger. When I left the squadron a large number of mosquitoes had arrived, still older modifications, but slightly better than the first ones we had received. They were fully equipped with serrate instruments and were gradually replacing the old tried and tested boo fighters. Despite the better performance of the mosquito, the squadron's successes initially went downhill. The enemy became wiser and took into account the capabilities of our airborne radars and serrate, employing various tactics and techniques to reduce their effectiveness. The remainder of the war became a battle between ours and his technical staff in radar development. At times the Germans had the advantage. Then it was our turn, and the 141st number of victories grew rapidly. Before leaving for Camberley, I spent a few days in Leicester with my family. I suppose I was a headache to my successor in those days. I kept pestering him with requests for an airplane to fly me just one more time. Robert A. was agreeable, but Air Group headquarters remained adamant. From there came the order Braham is not to fly any more combat sorties until his course is completed. So I returned to Leicester to spend the remainder of my short vacation there. Contact with my first love, 141 Squadron, was henceforth severed. And since then I have never known such a sense of camaraderie again. Naturally, Joan saw it in a different light. At least she didn't have to worry now for a while whether or not I had returned from a flight over enemy territory, although we still lived far apart. The knowledge that I was safe comforted her. The entire neighbourhood of Camberley was alive with army tradition and many beautiful homes of retired generals and their families were housed around the headquarters college. I was a little apprehensive, but on arrival I learned that there were five other Royal Air Force officers on the course, most of whom I knew well. I breathed a sigh of relief as the infantry, or army types, seemed a staid and arrogant lot compared to us. This opinion of mine was to change in the near future. I lodged with Russ Barry, who had just returned from North Africa, where he had become one of the most capable fighter wing commanders in the Royal Air Force. We were then staying at the Cambridge Arms, a nice hotel almost opposite the main gate of the college. It must have been frequented. The head of the college was Major General Wimberley, who had recently returned from the Middle East, where he had distinguished himself as commander of the 51st Highland Division as part of Montgomery's victorious Eighth Army. The instructors were mainly officers of the rank of lieutenant colonel, but included one wing commander in the Royal Air Force. Many of them had been in combat in various theatres of war. The people on the course were mainly army officers. But in addition to a small contingent of Royal Air Force, there were also representatives from the Royal Marines and the Armed Forces of Canada, Australia, 
the United States and Czechoslovakia. Our training sessions were conducted in mixed groups. Six Royal Air Force officers were allocated to six such groups, in which they effectively became advisors on the use of aviation. The days at Staff College went quickly, and unexpectedly I enjoyed them. My first impression of the infantry seemed mistaken. They were not as zany as the Royal Air Force lads, but made a cheerful and friendly bunch. At Camberley we studied the three main stages of warfare, withdrawing back, advancing forward and attacking. During the early years of the Second World War, the British became experts in the first of these stages. Retreat was regarded as the most difficult and confusing aspect of warfare. A commander had to keep morale high among his troops when things went wrong. If he failed, the withdrawal became a rout. The British Army could be proud that this never happened because the command was top-notch and the average British soldier had great courage. The Allies had recovered from the first heavy blows of the aggressor and we could now plan our advance and offensive. Humours were circulated about the opening of a second front. Given the terrific build-up in England of British, American and Dominion divisions, it seemed not long before these rumours became fact. Thanks to the proximity of Farpuro, I was still able to fly airplanes in my spare time. During weekends there I could pick up a Percival Proctor, a Tiger Moth, an Ara Tutor, and even an old Gladiator. Several army trainees and college professors flew one or another of these airplanes with me during my visits to Joan and the children in Leicester. One day Joan too took her first unofficial flight in a military airplane, an Aro Tutor. She enjoyed it very much. The only thing that bothered her was that the parachute strap had to be passed between her legs. Since she was wearing a skirt, quite a bit of her beautiful legs were exposed to my friend, an army captain who tried hard not to notice. During our training at Camberley, we were fortunate enough to talk to many high-ranking military commanders. Among them were General Montgomery, who commanded the famous Eighth Army, and General Anderson, who led the First Army in North Africa. I remember them especially well because they were completely unlikable personalities who generated tremendous interest and debate among us at the college. Many of the audience and faculty had served in the Eighth or First Armies, and the rivalry between the two was intense. During the talk, Monty later field Marshal Montgomery Viscount Alamine exuded an ease and confidence that was justified by his many glorious victories, at least one of which, at Alamine, turned the tide of the war in our favour. Anderson, on the contrary, seemed stern and even a little harsh. The reasons for this were easy to understand. His first army was largely new to battle. It consisted of British, French and American divisions, carelessly linked together and using different types of weapons and equipment, making its logistics a real nightmare. Also, due to political pressure, he was forced to bring his army into battle gradually, which paid miserable dividends. As an interested viewer, I felt that General Anderson was fighting brutal battles almost the entire time with his two small forces. Still, in the end, the 1st and 8th armies joined together in Tunisia and pushed the African-German Corps and the Italians out of Africa. We argued a lot, sometimes fiercely, with all for and against, over the campaigns of these two armies after their commanders appeared before us. During the field exercise, every officer in my group was assigned to a position on the notional divisional headquarters. I myself found myself in command of a notional tank brigade. Its bulky equipment was supposed to be concentrated and camouflaged before the offensive. I thought I had chosen excellent position. A road in the lowlands closed on both sides of the trees. It seemed a perfect natural cover from a real reconnaissance. It was too easy. Perhaps they would offer me permanent service as an army brigadier. My enthusiasm was soon destroyed by one of the intermediaries, who said to me as kindly as possible, and in a way that few of my comrades could hear, I'm sorry, old chap, but your tanks can be written off. They won't be able to climb these two steep slopes and will probably topple over. My dreams of leading tanks into battle were dashed. Anyway, the rest of the course learned of Briam's blunder, and over the next few days one air advisor listened to a lot of jokes. Perhaps some of us didn't take our studies as seriously as we should have. While many trainees studied late into the night in their rooms, a few went regularly to the Cambridge Arms. There we spent our time chatting to each other and the locals and draining containers of some popular but light beer. On the way back, it became our habit to hold a lighter under the chin of the white marble bust of Julius Caesar that cluttered at the foot of the main staircase in the lobby of Cumberley College. This had the effect of blackening the chin and making it appear that this warrior of the past was sporting a beard. 
As a result, every day one of the industrious janitors would shave this old gentleman in the early morning, and he was again ready to have a new beard in the evening. Such pranks varied the monotony of study. Up to this time I'd been fortunate enough not to have had to use a parachute once. One day we visited the paratrooper training centre at Salisbury Plain. We were shown the equipment and training methods of these select troops. In the field stood a training parachute tower 25-30 metres high, from which paratroopers jumped in all equipment. The speed of descent was regulated by a pulley, which simulated the fall after leaving the airplane. We watched the fearless men in red berets. Then the instructor asked if there were any volunteers from our course. We glanced around with timid smiles, but no one responded to the offer. After some confusion, my army friends turned to me, indicating that I should volunteer. After all, I am a pilot after all. Cursing them, I shrugged and agreed. I fearfully made my way up to the overhead platform, where a grinning instructor helped me put on the harness of the suspension system. There's nothing easy about it, sir. You just have to bend your knees and keep your feet together, and then you won't break your ankles. Encouraged by his kind words, I walked to the edge of the platform and, turning pale, looked angrily at the faces of my comrades visible far below. The next moment I felt a jolt in my back and flew downward with frightening speed. I hit the ground with a thud that took my breath away. Once I was assured that I was still in one piece, I rose from the sandy ground with a triumphant grin, ready to show my nose to my army buddies. In December 1943, I learned that 141 Squadron, which was now fully equipped with mosquitoes, had moved from Wittering to West Rainham in Norfolk. Short-lived ties with Fighter Command initially and with Air Defence Command later were now severed, together with the 239th and 169th Squadrons. Also armed with mosquitoes, it became part of the newly formed 100th Air Group under the control of Bomber Command. The story of the 100th Air Group deserves its own book. I will only briefly explain its role. The group was responsible for direct and indirect support of Bomber Command's offensive operations. Some squadrons, like the three above, had the task of shooting down enemy night fighters. Others, equipped with a variety of aircraft, flew in streams of bombers or performed diversionary raids, interfering with enemy radars and communication systems, making life as difficult as possible for enemy air defences. Finally, we had what some in our night fighter aviation had long demanded, a powerful grouping of night fighters capable of operating over the entire territory of the Third Reich. In late January of the new year, the 141st organised a reunion party at its new base at West Raynham. The invitation I received allowed me to bring three newfound army friends, including two Canadians, and Oxford was carefully sent from West Raynham to pick up the army men, while I myself flew in an old single-seat gladiator fighter as escort. How wonderful it was to meet up with old comrades again. Squadron leader Davis, who'd been one of my squadron leaders, was now in command of the squadron, replacing Roberts, who had been reassigned to a staff job. Charles Vinney and the old-timers, Buster Reynolds and Dickie Sparrow, were still serving there. The meeting was a boisterous success. As the party progressed, our amusements became rougher and rougher, but no one was seriously injured. In the last stage of the festivities, Vinny escaped and locked himself in the restroom. Chased by angry squadron members, he doused them with a fire extinguisher. The problem of his smoking out was soon solved. Someone brought in a very signal pistol and ammunition. It was fired into his hiding place through a window. This produced a fantastic amount of smoke, and soon Charles appeared, who, coughing and muttering something inarticulately, pounced on us. My army friends were amazed at what was happening, but seemed to be enjoying the whole thing. When we went to breakfast the next morning with heavy heads in the highest degree of caution, there were signs of the merry night everywhere. Broken dishes and damaged furniture were lying in their original places. However, the most priceless souvenir was the coal-black footprints on the ceiling of the dining room hall, the neat autograph of Buster Reynolds. We never found out how he got there. It must have been a unique operation. My army friends and I decided to leave before the angry air station commander showed up. We said goodbye to everyone in the 141st. We could find and quickly headed back to Faribourough, exhausted but brimming with happy memories of the wonderful encounter. I had heard nothing about where I was going to be sent after the course at Camberley, so I decided to push the personnel service types myself by visiting the 100th Group headquarters looking for a job. My only desire was to fly combat missions against the enemy again. 
After meeting with the group commander, I asked him if he could have me in one of his mosquito squadrons. He replied that he would like to see me at his headquarters where he thought my experience would be of great benefit. I experienced great disappointment. Later that day, I discussed tactics with the group's chief of operations and soon realized that I sincerely disagreed with the way Mosquito was being used. Although I deeply respected him, he was a brave and capable officer. It was obvious to me that we would not be able to work with him because of significant disagreements over the use of Serret-equipped aircraft. After friendly conversations and discussions, I declined the offer to take up staff work and, somewhat depressed, returned to Camberley, leaving it to the Air Ministry to decide the fate of my transfer. I must only add that the 100th group succeeded very well without me. Our last few weeks at Camberley were largely devoted to airborne operations and air support. This was natural in view of the huge build-up in Britain by the British and American armies and the 2nd Tactical Air Command of the Royal Air Force and the US Air Force's 9th Air Force. There were serious signs of preparations for the opening of the long-awaited Second Front by crossing the English Channel. One day I was informed that I was summoned by the chief of the college. I reported to his adjutant, and the latter escorted me to the major general. He already had an air vice marshal Embry, who I knew, who had recently taken command of the second light bomber group, now part of the second tactical air command. Embry asked me if I would like to work on his staff and help prepare the group for night operations. The group consisted of four squadrons of Mitchell bombers, two squadrons of Boston bombers, and six squadrons of Mosquito Mix-6 fighter bombers, all of which were still used exclusively for daytime raids. My job, if I accept, will be mainly with the Mosquito squadrons, which must be trained so that they can carry out low-altitude night attacks on German transports on land or water. Embry emphasized that this was one of the most important tasks, and that his group would be the only one capable of supporting the Allied armies at night when the decisive D-Day came. The offer was very flattering. But before agreeing, I said that I would like to take a personal active part in the action against the enemy. With a twinkle in his eye, he promised that he would allow me to perform a portion of combat sorties. Embry then told the general that he would like me to start my new job at once. The college chief replied that he would be sorry if I did not finish the course, so it was decided that I would stay on for the time being. I was happy at the thought that in spite of the staff work awaiting me, I would be able to face the Huns on occasion. Embry was one of the few senior Allied air commanders who believed that not only squadron crews, but also air station commanders and members of their own staff should be involved in combat sorties. He flew many sorties himself, despite the disapproval of the high command. He was a great commander who never demanded of any of his men what he would not do himself. The course ended on February 11, 1944, giving me a clear understanding of the problems of the British Army. It also shattered my superficial opinion of the infantrymen, among whom there were now many whom I could consider my friends, some of them permanent. Our farewell party was held in superb style in the main hall at Camberley. Towards the end of the evening, a joint group of Royal Air Force and Army representatives sought out a fire hose, and as a farewell gesture washed the oil portraits hanging on the walls of former college chiefs and other prominent Army commanders. It was with some trepidation that I arrived at the Second Air Group headquarters as the officer in charge of night operations. It was my first staff position. However, I was soon feeling at ease at Manjwell Park, a beautiful old mansion near Wallingford, Oxford. The promise that I would be able to fly combat sorties kept my spirits high. To Joan's disappointment, I still stubbornly insisted that it would be best if she and the family remained in Leicester. In that case, for me, war and family life would not mix. Squadron leader Rufus Risley took care of me until I got the hang of it. I quickly discovered that Embry had assembled a very experienced and successful staff, all the members of which burned with the same fire and were filled with the same spirit as himself. Medity to the old man and chief of operations was David Atchley, whom I had last seen at Devon in 1938, when he was in command of 85 Squadron. David and his twin brother Dick became legends before the war even started, thanks to their incredible exploits in the air. I doubt there will ever again be examples of such leadership and fantastic antics as those two airmen had. One of Rufu Yu's first household chores was to place me with Clemmy, the second house of the second air group. Mrs. Clementi owned the Wyatt Hart pub in the village of Nettlebt, a few kilometers from our headquarters. During my time in the second group, I had the privilege of being introduced to her, 
and I will always be grateful to her for her unfailing cheerfulness and fine character which were so beneficial to our morale. Earlier in the war she had lost her own son serving in the Navy, but skillfully concealed her sorrow. We were assured that we were always welcome at this place. When it was time for a break at 10.30, she invariably allowed the Royal Air Force personnel to stay. However tired she was, she would serve us traditional scrambled eggs and bacon from her kitchen. Remembering my promise to Styx and Jacko on leaving 141 Squadron, I had to try and get them both transferred to group headquarters. The personnel men helped, and a few days after my arrival at Manjuel, both my comrades joined me. The night operations headquarters was now staffed. The influx of night pilots had at first caused occasional rude remarks from the rest of the staff, who were overly proud of the group's daytime activities and were not too keen to switch partly to night flying. So far, the main efforts of the second group had been directed against enemy ships and military installations in occupied Europe and against the recently begun construction of FAR-1 positions between Calas and Liha. All sorties were flown during the day and required extremely accurate bombing from medium and low altitudes, in which the second group was unsurpassed. Following Overlord, the D-Day project, the planners' minds were occupied with the offensive against the Fey positions known as Crossbow. If most of these positions and storage sites for these weapons and rocket fuel were not destroyed, the enemy could seriously hamper Allied preparations for invasion. In addition, the populations of London and southern England were subjected to very destructive attacks by unmanned Fey-1 and later Fey-2 missiles. Air strikes and defence measures by the Royal Air Force and US Air Force greatly reduced the strength of the enemy attacks, although of course they reached London and surrounding areas. Overall, the military damage from the FAR-1 and FAR-2 was small, but nearly 10,000 people were killed and many were severely wounded. The attacks did not cease until the Allies captured all their launching positions in early 1945. But the second group had the honour of damaging and destroying more launcher positions in France than any other Allied air unit. Preparations for Operation Overlord were proceeding apace, and Embry's group, among other tasks, had an important role to play in attacking German lines of communication after our troops captured the bridgehead in Normandy. The work of training squadrons for night operations should be carried out as soon as possible. The most suitable for night action were six squadrons of mosquitoes, equally divided between the 138th and 140th wings, so a training plan was drawn up to train them, in the same way as the squadrons of night intruders, to the fighter command, with only one difference, that the planes of the second group in addition to the guns were to carry bombs. Our mosquitoes were a low-altitude modification of the MK6. They had no airborne radar, but were armed with 420 cannons and 47.7. Machine guns mounted in the nose and operated by the pilot. There was also a bomb bay for 4227 kg bombs, which could be fitted with various types of percussion or delayed action fuses. The second crew member was the navigator. Before the squadron's first night flight, Rufus and I, accompanied by Styx and Gico, visited both wings and gave a general briefing, emphasizing the importance of the task and some of the problems the crews might encounter. It seemed that because of the lack of allure of night action, people who were used to daytime combat were still unhappy about being forced to do the job but we knew that after a few sorties this dissatisfaction would disappear. We also noted that they would begin to do individual daylight sorties as well. To begin with, my small staff, with the help of the intelligence guys, planned sorties against a number of airfields in northern France, searching for these small targets, while flying at altitudes of 300 to 900 metres over the darkened continent was excellent night navigation training, and also provided a good opportunity to fire on any target worthy of attention. If we learned how to find and bombard airfields, then when the D-Day came, we could easily detect columns of German troops moving along the French roads. During the first sorties, crew's Mosquito learned to hit small targets, and losses were insignificant, so the initial dissatisfaction began to fade. I began to think about Embry's promise to let me fly combat sorties. For some time now, I had been fascinated by the opportunities afforded by one or two long-range fighters patrolling during the day deep in enemy territory. The 418th and 605th intruder squadrons, usually operating at night, demonstrated how successful such sorties could be. They achieved surprise and shot down many enemy aircraft of various types at the cost of minimal losses on their 
by flying at treetop level and avoiding areas with heavy anti-aircraft cover. There was a high probability that our fighters would not be detected until they struck. Such sorties could only be flown if there was cloud cover covering most of the sky at about 45600 meters. There was an obvious risk, but I felt that the probable destruction or damage to enemy aircraft and the confusion we would cause the enemy would more than compensate for it. The Mossy MK.6 was the ideal aircraft for such a job. Today, at low altitudes it was fast, maneuverable, had excellent range and strong armament. Since I had to have someone else to fly to the enemy, I told this to Styx and Jacko, who were already showing impatience. They met my suggestion with enthusiasm, although Jacko thought that night was the best time, as we were much more experienced in survival when the birds were on the ground. We discussed the possibility of flying during daylight hours, and ultimately my viewpoint prevailed. After that, I went to see the old man. Embry seemed genuinely interested, but insisted that I bring the plan for each of my proposed raids to him for approval before we took off. Further, he disapproved of the idea of our daylight flights directly over German territory because of the power of the German air defences, and because of the presence of a large number of single-seat fighters with which the Mosquito could not compete. Occupied Western Europe, however, had attractive targets. There were many airfields where enemy bombers and twin-engine Messer Schmidt 110 and Yupter's 88 fighters were based. I told the group commander that I wanted to attack the planes in the air rather than on the ground. In the air we were not only disabling the aircraft but also, more importantly, its crew. Past experience of both the Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe had shown that attacking aircraft on the ground, while effective in some respects, did not throw off the trained crew of the aircraft. In addition, Attacking aircraft were often severely damaged by anti-aircraft artillery fire. After receiving Embry's acquiescence, I asked him if I could make an attempt the next day, February 28, 1944. I showed him a route to the orleans burgess chateauden area in central France, where there were many bomber airfields. To my delight, he agreed, provided there was the necessary cloud cover. I returned to my office where Styx and Jacko were awaiting the result of the meeting and told them everything was in order. I decided that Jacko would accompany me. I wanted to prove to him that such sorties were really effective, knowing that he still doubted it. We consulted with the intelligence officers at group headquarters and worked out a detailed itinerary. We planned to fly around large cities and airfields at least eight kilometers away. Firstly, they had strong air defense, and secondly, if we flew over, the alarm would be raised. The coast of France was filled with many German units. They were capable of shooting down a low-flying airplane, both with rifle and machine gun fire and anti-aircraft battery fire. We therefore decided to cross the coast of France back and forth at an altitude of between 450 and 900 meters and then dive to the ground. We risked losing the element of surprise by climbing to an altitude where we could be picked up by enemy ground raiders, but it was an acceptable risk. They would have to be very lucky to detect us. Early in the morning, the meteorologist promised us the right cloud cover for the flight. We decided to launch from the sham. The kindly air station commander had prepared a mossy waiting for us, filled to the brim with fuel, including outboard tanks that could be jetted. If all went well, the flight would last three and a half hours, but we had enough fuel to be in the air for almost six hours. It was a cold morning and both engines had to be worked on to get the oil and coolant circulating properly. Then we taxied to the launch, hurtling down Lusham's runway at full speed. The Mosquito was picking up speed. We were flying over the Sussex countryside. Unfortunately, this first flight was not a success. The weather was worse than expected and visibility in the Orleans area was very poor. Our navigation was also faulty, and for some time we did not know where we were. Eventually, we were able to identify the town of Tours, on the banks of the Loire, which was away from our planned course. It was obvious that Jacko was having trouble navigating, and I realized that the prudent thing to do was to abort the flight, so we turned around and headed home. On the way back near Lemaire, a gasoline truck was fired upon. It was a Sunday. Many French civilians out for an afternoon walk witnessed the attack. Most of them had the foresight to watch the proceedings from the drops on either side of the road as we, with guns blazing, glided over their heads. The remainder of the flight was uneventful. Jacko later told me that he preferred to fly night sorties, in which he felt more qualified. I fully shared his position, but I felt sorry that I had never been able to prove to him the value of daytime sorties. A week later, I asked Styx 
what he thought about attempting another sortie. He was still very eager to do it. I went to the air group commander for permission, although after our first failed attempt I feared that he might consider such flights a waste of time. When I explained why my flight with Jacko was unsuccessful, Embry understood me, but forbade me to take foolish risks. From the recently received intelligence information was that the Germans transferred their newest heavy bombers, Heinkel 177, to airfields near Orleans, just in the area in which we were about to fly. These airplanes were four-engine monsters, with two engines on each of their wings standing in tandem, giving them the appearance of a twin-engine airplane. We speculated that they might have arrived there to prepare for raids on England, hence their attack was noteworthy. The weather the next day seemed destined to be ideal for our departure, so we made arrangements to have a prepared Mossy waiting for us again at Lasham. We set off for the second time into the interior of France. Stick sat beside me in the cramped cockpit, spreading the maps on his lap. Occasionally he would give me a little course correction. That day there was thick cloud cover with a lower edge at 460 metres. After about 35 minutes of flying we could see the French coastline. Styx had identified the point at which we were to cross the coast, and with about 6.5 km to go, I steered the Mossy sharply up into the clouds and levelled off at 900 metres. We flew at this altitude for about five minutes and then spiralled steeply towards the ground. We were now inside the enemy citadel, heading for Orleans and hoping we had not alarmed the Germans by our appearance. There was something exhilarating about gliding right over the French fields and trees, but we had to be on guard at all times, not only to keep out enemy planes, but also to avoid hitting a power line or tree. From flying like this, we were both soon completely soaked. Periodically we changed course by 20 or 30 degrees to, somehow, confuse any German observers as to the direction of our flight. Sticks navigated confidently. Soon we crossed the scene west of Rouen, and had it not been for the occasional French peasant or German soldier who probably mistook us for entertaining Luftwaffe pilots, we would have seen no one. The spires of Chartres Cathedral appeared in the distance. I tilted the airplane to the right, and the right wing nearly caught the ground as we skirted the city. It was probably full of German soldiers and covered by anti-aircraft batteries. We were flying over the Loya Valley with its beautiful chateau, near Orleans, and yet we saw no sign of airplanes. I began to feel disappointed, shared my doubts with sticks. Where were the elusive Luftwaffe airplanes? We flew south another 80 km, and, having found no aircraft near the Borges airfield, laid down on a course for home via Chateauden. I was about to conclude that the flight was again a waste of time when Stick said, Hmm, what's that? In the distance beyond my right plane I could make out the runway of the airfield. An airplane taking off, barely visible as a black blob, was kicking up dust with its propellers. That dust was what caught Stix's attention. For a second or so we watched, still holding the mossy near the ground. Perhaps the Germans had finally detected us, and an enemy fighter was taking off to intercept us. I increased speed so that we could quickly disappear into the clouds, if our suspicions were correct, as our Mossy could not compete with several Messerschmitt 109s or Focke-Wolfs 190s. We could now see that the Black Blob was only one airplane, and a very large one at that, with a shout of triumph, with which I almost deafened sticks. I threw our Mossy into a steep turn and headed for Chateauden. It's about 1.5 km from the airfield perimeter. We flew over the German anti-aircraft artillery positions and were amazed to see the enemy gunners waving at us, thinking we were one of their planes. To please them, we waved back. The surprise was complete. We were now rapidly approaching the target, which we recognised as one of the big Heinkel 177s. It was making a turn over the airfield at an altitude of 300 metres. We stayed near the ground until the last minute, approached our target from the front and slightly to the side. At a distance of about 800 metres, I began a smooth turn with an altitude gain, so that the massive fuselage of the bomber was directly in front of us. I got into position to open fire. At the last moment the enemy realised we were hostile and tried to turn away, but it was too late. I reduced my turning radius slightly so that the crosshairs of my electric sight, given the necessary anticipation, were in front of the bomber and pressed the fire button. A stream of 20 mm shells and 7.7 bullets rained down from the nose of the Mossy as I continued to reduce my turning radius so that I could keep my sight on the rapidly approaching target. I started firing at about 360 metres. 
and now from a distance of 90 meters, the Hypekel 177 seemed as big as a house, a stream of fire and smoke appeared down the nose of the plane. It stood up on its haunches like a wounded animal, and flipping over the wing onto its back, fell vertically to the ground. The explosion that went off was like the explosion of an oil tanker, a huge ball of red flame and puffs of dense oil smoke. My God, was the only thing I could utter. It all happened so fast that none of the unfortunate crew had a chance to parachute out. There was no time for pity. We had done our job and now had to leave. Leaping towards the ground at 480 Kutame, we flew home in triumph. As we flew over the fields a few kilometers from Chateaudea, we spotted a young boy and girl who ran out of their house and waved frantically at us. They had probably seen the battle and could certainly observe the funeral column of smoke. So our victory gladdened the hearts of two inhabitants of enslaved France. Three and a half hours after taking off, we landed at La Cham. A few hours later, Styx and I were drinking beer in a bar in Manjuel, recounting the circumstances of our victory to other members of the staff. The film of my movie camera, synchronized with the guns, had already been processed. Embry asked to see it, and we moved with the whole crowd to one of the meeting rooms, where the confirmation of our victory was shown on the screen. I now felt that I had proved the value of day flying to both the boss and the group as a whole, and looked forward to more sorties in the future. Day flying was very different from night fighting, but I found the daytime victory to be just as satisfying and exciting. A week later, on March 12, Styx and I took to the air again. This time we intended to fly much farther as far as Toulouse, but already at the very beginning we encountered a problem. As I was diving toward the ground after crossing the French coast near Badiou, I thought I saw a flash and heard a faint whistling sound. I asked Styx about it, but he didn't see or hear anything. Everything seemed to be in order, and I forgot about it at once. But it wasn't long before I noticed that the oil temperature in the right engine was starting to rise dangerously. As I watched, the arrow reached a dangerous line. There was some serious malfunction, and I told Styx to quickly calculate our course home. In the meantime, I turned our airplane around in the general direction of England, I turned off the faulty engine, and continued flying on one. Our Mossy flew quite well on one engine as well. Forty-five minutes later, we were back on the ground at La Cham. We found that the oil line had been broken by a bullet and dark liquid was leaking out of it. Apparently, some German sniper had shot at us. I don't know why the engine didn't catch fire, although a lot of oil poured out onto the hot radiator and exhaust manifolds. Luck was with us again. Two days later, Jacko and I travelled to London for the official awards ceremony. We received from the King's hands the awards we had been honoured with a few months earlier. Jacko a buckle to the Distinguished Flying Cross, and I a buckle to the Distinguished Flying Cross, and a second buckle to the Distinguished Flying Cross. In London, we met Jacko's parents, Joan and my father, who were invited to attend the ceremony. A large crowd of guests were present at the palace, in addition to groups of servicemen from all three branches of the military. Several civilians also received awards. Our families, along with the other guests, made their way to the great hall used for such occasions. While Jacko and I followed the courtier to the reception room, where each of the honorees was instructed on how to approach the king when your name was called, despite previous visits to Buckingham Palace. I was excited as my seat was in the front row. A few minutes later, the orchestra played the national anthem and King George I've entered the crowded hall with his courtiers. The highest honorees were called up first. The line moved slowly. I looked for Joan and my father among the guests. When I saw them, I took a moment to wink at them. When my name was called, I marched to the king, turned to my left, bowed and stood before him. He wore the uniform of a navy admiral. He reached back with his left hand to the cushion in his aide's arms, on which the awards lay. First, he handed me a buckle to the Distinguished Combat Service Order on a red and blue ribbon, simultaneously thanking me for what I had done and wishing me continued success. Then, continuing to speak, he calmly turned to get the buckle to the cross for flying combat merits. But I saw with the corner of my eye that the cross itself was lying on the cushion. Somebody is embarrassed? He frowned for a second. I was worried, waiting to see what was about to happen. The king spoke briefly in a whisper to his aide, then turned to me and asked me to wait nearby. I was to be called again at the end of the ceremony to receive the award I had been honoured with. An hour later my name was called again. By this time the king must have exchanged handshakes and talked to nearly two hundred people, but he was still capable of smiling and made a friendly joke about the incident, 
as he presented me with a buckle to the distinguished flying cross. Apparently, even in the higher realms, sometimes they get it wrong. Although receiving the award from the king was a majestic moment, I found that it was much harder on my nerves to stand in front of this great man in a crowded hall than to fight the enemy.